Again, sisters and brothers, I want to express my deep appreciation to the dean of this divinity school and to the faculty and others who have asked me to be the co-lecturer for 2009. And I want to express my appreciation to you who are here uh, today as well. Um, Jim has rightly indicated the extent to which I have seen myself not trying to make an apology for the Christian religion or a defense of the Christian religion because I suspect too often that the Christian religion um, is rooted in other themes and persons rather than Jesus of Nazareth. I see myself trying to lift up a doctrine, a gospel rather, of Jesus and a religion of Jesus, not about Jesus or <laughs> for Jesus, but to the best of my ability, at least over the years, to understand this as being deeply rooted in the heart and mind of Jesus. I have followed for many years the whole discussion of the historical Jesus and the various quests. I think those quests have been of tremendous importance for Christianity, though many segments of Christianity think they have been uh, heretical, <laughs> if not agnostical, if not irrelevant to the worship of an understanding of the gospel. But I think that they have increasingly helped us to unpack Jesus in a fashion that we have not known in Christianity before, in which Christianity deeply requires. And so this, this morning I want to try to speak for uh, a few moments on the unfettering of Jesus. More than, more than 40 years ago now, I had a Good Friday experience in 1963, which has haunted my thought and imagination and tickled my senses. And yes, as I have reflected and as it, crept, as it has crept back into consciousness from time to time, often been disturbed by it, while at the same moment appealing to more expansive options. The Southern Christian Leadership Conference, of which I was a volunteer staff person in the 60s, was in the middle of the Birmingham campaign with Fred Shuttlesworth and the American, and the, uh, the Alabama Christian Movement for Human Rights. The print and electronic media were all over the streets wherever our staff and others uh, moved, we would find them. But on that Good Friday, a major question was, would Dr. King march or not? Marching in Birmingham meant from the first day almost uh, an immediate an arrest by the Bull Connors police forces. We had a very, very early morning strategy meeting in the Gaston Motel. And in the middle of that meeting, Martin King announced that he would go ahead and march on Good Friday on that day. Uh, I was asked to do the briefing for the action of that day, which meant that around 9 o'clock we gathered in the 16th Street Baptist Church where I did the briefing from the pulpit uh, in the chancel um, of all those who were going to march. The place was filled, uh, it did not have a balcony, but every pew was, and every aisle literally was jam-packed with people shoulder to shoulder not all of them by any means planning to participate in the march that day, uh, that number being a relatively small number. But after I'd done the breaching, the briefing and the instructions, Ralph Abernathy and Dr. King, who were sitting in the first pew uh, to my right, and others in that same pew who were going to go uh, and commit the civil disobedience with them, uh, they stood up and I had instructed them to move down the front of the chancel to the far aisle 
which was directly connected then to the major outdoor exit uh, onto 16th Street. Um, as they got up and moved, and perhaps 40 or 50 people moved with them, and as they reached that aisle, I heard a voice back in that far corner in the standing room only section. Um, the voice sounded above the noise. Uh, it came from someone packed against that back corner on my right. I could not spot the person. It was a male voice, but it sounded like a trumpet with a high C note sounding and penetrating everyone's ears. And that voice urgently insisted, there he goes, just like Jesus. It shattered the decorum of that daily demonstration for me. Was it simple folk folklore? Was it an exaggeration? An unwarranted emotional outburst? But throughout that, decade, I heard similar affirmations, not about Jesus as Lord and Christ, but about other heroes and heroines in the delta of Mississippi or in the southwest part of Georgia, where in the midst of risk, sometimes death, often the sheer fright of taking a short walk to a county office to register to vote or to walk on Main Street protesting shameful mistreatment of ordinary people. I heard that phrase again about different people. Uh, people who felt in <clears throat> the embodiment of a person in their midst, a sense of, of hope and a sense of the incarnation of the presence of eternity through some ordinary man or woman who seemed to reflect for them the presence of life itself. I heard this about Rosa Parks and Nell Ponder, Bob Moses, Charles Seward, many names that we no longer even know. So my theme for this morning comes from the second chapter of the short book of Second Timothy, the eighth and ninth verses. This is probably not a letter of Paul. It is clearly, it seems to me, at least written much later. But here are the words. Remember Jesus Christ, risen from the dead, descended from David, as preached in my gospel, the gospel for which I am suffering and wear, wearing fetters like a criminal. But the word of God is not fettered. So the first point I want to make this morning is that in a very real way, Jesus of Nazareth, as one of the extraordinary human beings who ever lived, as the word made flesh, is in many ways in American Christianity fettered, shackled, encapsulated in so many forms of armor and onion skin that not even the Jesus of the four books that we do have in our Bible can leap out of those pages into the consciousness of life. It was very puzzling for me as a freshman student in college to read Reinhold Niebuhr and Paul Ramsey and others who insisted that many of Jesus' ideas, especially as found in the Sermon on the Mount, were an interim ethic, or an ethic only for some persons to attempt to live out, not to be taken seriously by the church as a whole, and certainly not by any nation, certainly not a, any kind of call for the church to try to practice 
in the political scenery of the United States. I found that very puzzling because by this time, uh, I had made the Bible my most valuable book. I had learned to read, in part, from the King James Version uh, in my childhood. And so for me, the four Gospels attracted my attention over and over again, almost on a daily basis. And I, I could not understand what uh, certain theologians and others were suggesting. The, the ideas of Jesus became practical tools for my uh, becoming uh, more alive and more human against a hostile society. The ideas of Jesus formed in me a sense of Jesus as my teacher and mentor and example for the development of personality and character and for the way in which I manage my own anger and fears. Later in the early 50s, I learned of Howard Thurman in his classic essay, Jesus and the Disinherited. He writes, the basic fact is that Christianity as it was born in the mind of this Jewish teacher and thinker appears as a technique of survival for the oppressed. Now think about that for a moment. I grew up in the streets of Ohio. There I met at age four all sorts of racial slurs and hostile incidents. It didn't occur for me in a segregated Nashville, but in a desegregated Ohio. And through my parents and my congregation, the St. James AME Zion Church in Maslin, I heard a clear uh, second voice again and again. Thurman goes on. His message focused on the urgency of a radical change in the inner attitude of the people. He recognized fully that out of the heart, out of the heart, are the issues of life and that no external force, however great and overwhelming, can at long last destroy a people if it does not first win the victory of the spirit against them, to revile because one has been reviled. This is the real evil because it is the evil of the soul itself. Now, that represents an entirely different sort of vision of Jesus. Indeed, for too many centuries we have clothed Jesus in medieval-like, medieval knights-like medieval armor helmet and breastplate and even leg armors and not just one set but set after set several layers of, of armor. Very often that armor is dogma. Very often that, augma, that armor rather is the way in which we practice our Christianity so quick to shun some people, so quickly to yell sinner at others so quick to exclude people that we think are marginalized and are different from ourselves. Well, I happen to think that the major responsibility and mission of Christianity in the 21st century is to revolutionize itself, re-examine its systems of belief, and I think almost all of them or face chaos, if not uh, extinction. I'm very much aware of the fact that in 1892, when this lectureship was established, Christianity was, on, was feeling a great amount of the shaking of time and history. And the Darwinian thesis on evolution was introduced in that uh, century caused a lot of people to, to question in various ways how they had been taught about 
the creation of life. The churches were divided, badly divided, over slavery and over the emergence out of the Civil War into the new era. And, and uh, that was a time in our society when there was great hatred and great killing. Lerone Bennett, uh, one of the historians about that period of time, says that 130,000 black people, largely black people, though some white people, were shot and killed or uh, just devastated in that period after the Civil War into the 20th century. I'm also aware that 1895 began the series of Bible conferences in Niagara Falls. These conferences sought to stabilize the Bible. It's out of these conferences that came the notion of the inerrancy of the Bible the bodily resurrection of Jesus, the notion that the Bible must be seen and read literally. You can trace that history in many different places in our, in our land. The Bible took on the form of an, an idol. And then around the turn of the century came the Azuzu Street revivals that produced the Pentecostalist movement, that movement was, in my judgment, somewhat dangerous for the black community. Until this time, 1906, 1910, 1910 rather, um, um, black people had a passion to build schools, to learn to read and write, to, to insist of education as one of the ways not only to get a different quality of life, but also as a way to oppose the hostility in our land. Um, the Pentecostalist movement came in with the notion that you didn't have to have education to be saved, that a preacher needed only the baptism of the Holy Spirit to do the work of the pastorate. My, fa my father at that time was considered something of an oddity um, in the years of his ministry in the 30s and the 40s and into the 50s. Well, I think I'm laying the framework to insist that Christianity needs complete, if not radical restructuring and rethinking in a world where a billion people stay hungry not because of their own lack of wanting food but because of the systemic world systems that we've put together uh, how does a doctrine of original sin uh, feel in such a world as ours. So I would insist that Jesus is the key to the change that Christianity needs. In the five congregations I've pastored in Ohio, Tennessee, and California, I always found a hardcore group of disciples of Jesus who embodied unconditional grace for everyone. And so I do this disclaimer because I suspect all across our land and elsewhere, there are a vast invisible group of people who do not reflect the concerns of those of us who are the leaders of the churches and the like. In a variety of ways at leadership levels, for an example, I've noticed the debates over gay lesbian issues, but over the issues of war, the issues of economics, in which there's no effort at all um, to think in a Jesus fashion concerning the public discussion or the current discussion. No effort to somehow understand where Jesus might stand in our midst of those issues. So I see a major task for us to unfetter Jesus, break the ways that we have bound him 
so that the power of God for life becoming full gets limited before many of us even cross the threshold of understanding in whose name we have been baptized and in whose name we live and move. So may I suggest a major unfettering of Jesus, and I'd like to do this by suggesting the need for us to see Jesus as a nonviolent practitioner and theorist of the first century. As a nonviolent son of God, son of man, as a nonviolent pioneer. Now I say this recognizing that the term nonviolence is not going to be found in the Bible and we should not impose it upon the Bible. The term nonviolence was invented by Gandhi around 1906, 1907 in South Africa. In his early years of experimenting with resisting injustice, Jesus took a Zainist ancient Hindu concept, ahimsa, Ahimsa was about having a passion for the living, a passion for life that you sought to, to uh, walk and act so as not to injure any living creature, to harm any form of life. He translated ahimsa not, at, not simply as a way of love, but he translated it then as meaning nonviolence. He was in the midst of the campaign for the Indians to break, Indian immigrants in, in South Africa, to break the back of a tyrannical South African government. And he wanted to give the people he was organizing uh, a term to use to understand that while they did not fight back with violence and hatred, they did fight back with a tenacity that could make a difference and change their own environment in that country. So I'm trying to say here that while the theory and practice of nonviolence is to be found in the ancient world as th and also throughout U.S. history, the term only became current at the beginning of the last century, and primarily introduced by Gandhi, and then made uh, more powerful by Martin King in the mid-20th century. Um, it was not called nonviolence in 19th century America by the anti-slavery societies that agitated and protested what they thought to be the shameless sin of their country. It is not to be confused with pacifism in the 20th century, though some pacifists in the Western world like A.G. Musty or Dorothy Day did indeed adopt a Gandhian analysis of, non, of, of pacifism and added to it the theories of power and strategy and the like. Nonviolent, excuse me, Jesus is a nonviolent mirror of the nonviolence of God. Let's just take one passage, Luke 4. 14 to 30. It is a place where, in my own imagination, Jesus' very presence begins to arouse anger and a mob-like climate. Read that section for yourself. In his home a city, a community, or village of Nazareth, in the synagogue, and there is such hostility towards Jesus that apparently the people who surrounded him became an angry, motley group and wanted to take Jesus 
out of the synagogue towards the rim of the city to throw him over a precipice uh, and, and thus end his life and ministry. But the very last verse, the 30th verse, says something like this, that Jesus walked through the midst of them. Now, some people may want to try to claim that this is kind of a supernatural thing, but there are experiences in our human history of people walking in the midst of mobs and quelling the animosity sufficiently that they could walk through the mob unharmed. July 4th, 1745. In Falmouth, England, John Wesley records in his journal. He records incidents like this several times, where a mob was aroused by his presence in the village with no other impetus for their anger except knowing about this man and where John Wesley was able to quell them and to get protection from leaders in the mob and walk through the midst of them to go on his way to continue his own mission and work. Well, Jesus is a nonviolent practitioner and theorist. If this be the case, of course, that means that the church and churches and Christianity must take a different attitude towards public policy. But look for a moment the way in which Jesus carried out his work. He walked, he demonstrated all over the territory in which he was birthed and lived whether it was Caesarea Philippi or Galilee or Samaria or Judea. Often as he walked, he had people around him. The Gospel of Mark tells us that at times he had the people sit down in companies of 50 and 100, so they had, there was some order to these gatherings. He did not reach out carrying charity to people, but his very movements around, let's say, Galilee was, as many scholars point out today, a protest to a Roman Empire and an insistence that the Roman Empire was not the final word for history or for the people. He reached out for justice, not for charity. So practically, he used the means and techniques that were at his hands to make the presence of the kingdom and the presence of God's spirit evident to the people he organized and mobilized. He was a theorist. Gandhi later leaves, lifts up the notion that in practical ways, we human beings must make our means and our ends conjoin. That, as he says, as he writes, the means that we use are in the ends that we receive. We may not be able to do that much about consequences, but if we recognized that how we do it is interwoven with the consequences, we might do far better in understanding why it is that we sow good intentions but receive consequences that are not anywhere connected to what we say that we intended.
Here, for an example, again, Jesus speaking. Are grapes gathered from thorns or figs from thistles? And of course, the answer of the audience is, of course not. You reap grapes from grape vines. You get figs from fig trees. There is a spiritual order in life. But if you sow thistles, you should expect to get thistles. If you're going to use the means that are wrapped in the heart of life itself, where you live and work, you have some chance of getting consequences that are commensurate. Or again, theory of nonviolence. You and your enemy are the common recipients of God's grace and God's creation and God's love. For God allows the sun to rise on the evil and on the good. God sends the rain on the just and the unjust. So you cannot divide up human life, God's creation, into the evil and the good, the just and the unjust, for the very nature of creation is a blessing of God for all of you. And so if you would be the children of God, the sons and daughters of God, you must pray for your own family and for your own opponents alike. You must hold them both up, not to the same kind of love or respect, but to a fundamental sense that the enemy is nevertheless a recipient of God's grace. Jesus boldly asserts that if you want to be the daughters and sons of God, then you must treat in occupied Galilee the Roman legionnaire with decency and respect. See, in that legionnaire is the Quakers later on proposed something of the spark of God. He was a practical devotee of nonviolent techniques, but he was also a theorist who insisted that the unconditional grace of God applied to all humankind, and those who would worship God must worship God by practicing daily an undiluted compassion for humanity. Now, I'm not here pushing Jesus as a nonviolent practitioner primarily against the notion of war. War is bad enough. There's no doubt about that. But I want to push Christianity in the United States and the churches in the United States to recognizing that a nonviolent Jesus must feel great shame at our tolerance of the violence and hostility that we tolerate in the United States the intolerance of the mouth and language and the intolerance of the fist and the gun, as well as attitudes towards one another, which mean that, means that we will always be divisive unless we can break the boundaries of that hostility. Let me give you one illustration, just one. According to the recent reports from the FBI, that keeps the statistics on murder. In the last year for which this was available, announced earlier this year, 2009, five women a day are killed by um, current or ex-husbands or boyfriends or the like. Five a day. That's a larger cost than just murder alone than the Vietnam War, I'm, I'm sorry, than the Iraq War or the Afghan War. Five a day. This does not include the assault 
on women in our society. This does not include the abuse, the verbal abuse that goes on in far too many homes. Portions of Christianity in the United States believe that gay, lesbian people represent the destabilization of the American family. But I would propose to you that the destabilization of the American family is more from the reign of male chauvinism and violence than from almost any other factor perhaps other than the eco economic factor in our country today. When do we of Christianity rise up, not so much about Iraq and Afghan, bad as they are, but the various forms of personal and structural violence that every day deprives children and women and others of the fruits of being created by the Creator. The dogmas about Eve which allow a male-dominated society to tolerate this, and the media to not report on it or not indicate it, to use personal violence as a means of making us afraid, whereas the structural violence is the danger in our nation, what is it that Paul said that we fight not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers, structures, forces, what in the United Methodist Church we call spiritual forces of wickedness in our membership vows that cannot be laid at the doorstep of any one person or any one institution but which we have inherited. But in inheriting them, we seem to be unaware that the kitchen and one's own kitchen and bedroom is more dangerous than any street corner in the United States still. On fettering Jesus, stripping aside the layers with which we have bound him and allowing an unfeathered, unfettered Jesus to reach us and to address us. I want to suggest something like this, that maybe we in the churches should soften our arrogance concerning how one is saved or how this country can be saved. Maybe we need to soften even our demand. Jesus Christ is King of the universe and Lord and Savior of life. Maybe we ought to put that aside for a while. Jesus insisted that the way to know me is to follow me. The way to discover the way is by in the 21st century seeing if we can get into the heart and mind and spirit and labor of a Jesus of Nazareth. Take the risks that that might involve and allowing the experience to convince us that we are touching the garment of eternity, that we, in fact, are being transformed and made anew by the conviction that God is in our midst and working in and through and around us. In one of the great books of the 20th century, Albert Schweitzer and the historical Jesus that has caused almost anyone who's interested in Jesus to uh, think through the unro unraveling of biblical studies of, out of the 19th century into the 20th century, closes that monumental book with these words that I s suggest it's a way forward to an unfettered Jesus. He comes to us as one unknown, without a name. As of old, by the lakeside, Jesus came to those men who knew him not. I would add men and women who knew him not. 
He speaks to us the same word, follow thou me. And sets us to the task which he has to fulfill for our time. He commands, and to those who obey him, whether they be wise or simple, he will reveal himself in the toils, the conflicts, the sufferings, which they shall pass through in that fellowship and as an ineffable mystery. They shall learn in their own experience, not as an intellectual understanding or as a creedal notion, not as a gospel about Jesus, but they will learn through their own time and place and journey, who he is. I, I go with very strongly uh, uh, Marcus Borg, who insists that it is through the experience of following listening to eternity, that we get our lives convicted to a certainty beyond our imagination, that Jesus, and we human beings as well, can reflect companionship of life and love and eternity. I do not know how we can more specifically get engaged in the unfettering of Jesus, but I am persuaded that eternity is to be found in the presence of that person. And that if we are going to reiterate that notion in our own time, will come more from throwing one's life into the cauldron of overturning cruelty, of resisting injustice, of moving through nonviolent goodwill against all the forces of fear and hostility. And in that process, we will gain light beyond our imagination and hopes. I appreciate this opportunity to be before you this morning and wish you well. Thank you.